You're listening to the PJF Podcast, a show dedicated to decoding elite sports performance and fitness. I'm Paul Fabritz, and I'm an MBA strength and conditioning and performance trainer. If you want to become superhuman, take your fitness, and take your sports performance to the next level, this is the podcast for you. Let's do it. What's up, guys? Welcome to episode one of the PJF podcast. I'm here with our co-host, Skylar Hood. So for those of you guys who don't know Skylar, uh, he's been working with PJF Performance since we first moved to California, which was, what, four years ago? And so Skylar has a foot in the door of strength and conditioning and also as a basketball head coach. So uh, he's a great person for Uh, this podcast because he asks really good questions and we've always had really good conversations and and we've always talked about if we just recorded these conversations we feel like a lot of coaches a lot of athletes a lot of everyday uh, people could really benefit from this podcast so uh, I'll I'll turn it over to Skyler. Hey what's up guys I'm uh, happy to be here Uh, you know I think this is gonna be a lot of fun here with Paul Favorites of uh, of PJ Performance Uh, like you said we've had a a lot of good uh, interesting conversations over the years so we're, we're happy to bring those here to you guys um, so we're going to get right into it and just uh, start off with, uh, with you, Paul. What, why a podcast now? Yeah, so it's really just by popular demand. Uh, I've always done short form content. So Instagram is a minute and now we can do a little bit longer with IGTV. Uh, but people have always wanted more. They've always wanted to go more in depth. Like I always say, it's more verticals, less horizontals. So uh, not as many topics, but we can go deeper into those topics that we do uh, go into. So Um, I think this is going to be a great podcast for anybody who is an athlete who just wants to get to the next level and get good science-based information, uh, good for a coach, a strength and conditioning coach, even a basketball coach or a skills trainer who just needs to be knowledgeable in the body and start to understand the science behind uh, why we do what we do. And even the everyday parent or uh, the general gym goer who just wants to get fit, get in shape, uh, and become superhuman. So that's kind of what this podcast is going to be all about. Okay. So the, uh, those of you that aren't, aren't familiar with, uh, Paul's backstory as well as I am, um, he's coming out of a Northern Arizona high level basketball player early. Paul kind of take us through that transition, how you went from player to high level trainer. Yeah. So I was kind of forced into it in a way because as a player, it was all in. It was like, go to the league or go overseas, make my living off basketball. There's no backup plan. And uh, unfortunately, I started getting a ton of injuries. So actually starting my junior year of high school, I started getting injuries. Um, Got injured my junior year, got injured my senior year right before the season. Uh, Then freshman year of college, I got injured. Sophomore year of uh, college, I got injured. So I just had injury after injury after injury. And it was always right at the beginning of the season. So it it seemed like I was just having the worst luck, uh, but it was, you know, something pointing me in the different, in a different direction. And so I started studying uh, day and night, like as much as I possibly could exercise science. I was going for my degree in exercise science, uh, but I started getting all the necessary certifications for personal training. Um, I got my ACE, I got my NSCA, I already did all the studying for my CSCS, which you can't actually take until you graduate, but I had done all the studying already, you know, as a 20 year old uh, basketball player. And I just realized how passionate I was about the exercise side of stuff. And sort of the more I learned, uh, the more I could apply to my game. And in one year, I put 12 inches on my vertical jump. And so I went from barely touching the rim uh, to throwing down full windmill dunks, 360 dunks, got faster, got stronger. You know, every physical component uh, was was leveled up. So I went back to Northern Arizona University, uh, which is where I'm from, Flagstaff, Arizona. And uh, I was going to walk on the team and I had earned my spot. Uh, it had looked like I was going to probably get significant minutes. Um, and then I had another injury. And so I had a decision to make either I could come back and my coach was saying the next year was looking very promising for me and I could get back on track of my original goal and play uh you know my junior play my senior year um and then try to go overseas and go get paid that you know that's the original goal 
But at the same time, I had transformed my vertical 12 inches, and I knew that that's not something that people commonly do. And all of the coaches that I had talked to who, had, who were recruiting me in high school and saw me again after I put on the 12 inches, they all said it's the biggest transformation they've ever seen. They've all said they, we don't see anything like that. You know, we see a kid grow five inches and then they start dunking, but we've never seen somebody stay the same height and make that transformation. And so I realized what I had was pretty special. And so uh, in my off time, I started just training kids on the side. So I was up in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I would just train kids for free. Uh, at the park, I would get into my old high school and train kids just wherever I could. And kids were getting really good results. Uh, they, 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 they were putting significant inches on their vertical. They were getting faster and stronger. And it started kind of going viral, uh, just word of mouth within Arizona. And so I moved to Tempe, Arizona, because I figure if I want to scale, I got to get to a bigger city. And um, I rented space out of a little garage gym in Tempe right around Arizona State. Um, and high school players started coming from all across uh, Arizona, eventually got up to college players, eventually got up to some ASU players, and everybody was seeing really, really good results. Uh, eventually, Instagram came out. Uh, with the option to do videos back when it was still, I think, 15 second videos. And I said, okay, I'm going to give out a tip every single day, vertical jump tip, ball handling tip, you know, whatever I can do. I just want to provide value. Uh, mostly, I didn't see it really as a marketing tactic. It was just, uh, I want to put out value. Like I'm passionate about this stuff. How can I help other people? And so I started putting out a video a day and people just started finding me. At one point I was gaining over a thousand followers a day. Uh, NBA players were finding me through Instagram and I had some NBA players actually fly in uh, to Tempe, train with me, and then they would fly back out. And so I was still in college. I was still going to ASU and I basically had a full on NBA training business going. Um, so at that point, I was still, you know, at the peak of my game because now I had rested for a year. I put on five inches on my vertical the next year. So 12 that first year, five the next year. So I'm a whole different player at this point. Uh, and, and, and I still had the skill. Uh, I could shoot it a little bit. I had the handle. Um, so, you know, part of me was like, well, now that I'm healthy, I could try out, I could go overseas or something. But, you know, I, I, I really realized that transforming another athlete's athleticism and helping them satisfied me way more than basketball ever did. So I looked at it like, well, I would get an email from somebody saying that I helped them transform their vertical and they're now getting a scholarship. For me, that felt better than a game winning shot. And once I realized that, I said, okay, I could take this and I could run with it. And this could last me until I'm 80 years old. Whereas basketball, even if I go grind and make an overseas team, I'm not going to make great money and I'm going to be grinding hard. And then my career is going to end at what, 30 years old. Yeah. And then I got to come back and figure out what to do. And so I kind of push basketball to the side and, you know, I, I've, I've always done, you know, over the last seven or eight years, I've always put out little basketball videos and, you know, you've probably seen the comments, why don't you go pro? Yeah. Um, and that's really the answer is I, I like training far more than I ever liked playing. Yeah. And I always knew that, I got the most, I think, out of my body as a player, you know, uh, as a 5'11 guy, I think I got the most out of myself. I don't think I would have ever been an NBA player or at least a high level player. And anything that I get into, I like to try to, you know, take it over and make a huge impact. So I could either be a low level player or I could be a trainer that really influences thousands of lives and maybe hopefully, you know, transforms the industry someday. And so I, I went with that option. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of value just in, in your overall story in general, just having, you know, gone through those injuries, um, but chose to stay passionate in regard to the game and then figure out how to re-engineer yourself, um, kind of make up for those injuries as well as make up for that prerequisite athleticism that you'd been told that you'd been missing. Um, and so I know, you know, just the thousands of players that go out there that suffer injuries and, and kind of mentally beat themselves up. I think there's a lot of value in just your, your origin story of, of how can you translate that, that frustration, that competitive desire to show your worth on the court into um, you know, growth in, in, in different facets. Uh, so, right. You know, and that's the key. What you just mentioned is taking what I learned through basketball, taking what you learn as a competitor and transferring that into your professional life. That's where people go wrong is you learn so much from your sport that you grew up playing 
uh, from you know the, the passion, the competitive spirit, everything that you learn, uh, the dedication, and then you go get into your normal job and that does not transfer. And so you don't see people be being dominant in sports and then dominant in, in their career after sports. And so that's the one thing that I think I did really well is I took 100% of that passion. I took everything that I learned and I just applied it to being a trainer. And so when you actually do that effectively, you can become dominant. Yeah. And I think the, the self-awareness also plays a, a pivotal role too because, you, you know, you pioneered a field. Um, you went into personal training, but you went to personal training specific to the sport that you were passionate about, specific to the love of basketball. And you've, you know what I mean? I tell people when I, when I talk about you on a casual basis um, in regard to Instagram and, you know, you see it so prevalent now, just the, the Instagram personal trainers, the online programs and stuff like that. I'm like, you know, Paul started when, you know, like you said, 15 second videos were out there and, and just to bring value um, towards your passion. And, and so I think, you know what I mean? Your level of self-awareness, whether you knew it or not at the time, um, and staying true to your passion and then trying to grow yourself and grow value for other people, you know, as, as definitely, you know, played a large part of where you're at now. Yeah. And I don't know if I completely pioneered the field. I think there were people before me. It's just, I was able to kind of take that and scale it bigger. You know, I think you had your Tim Grovers, you had your people who were in basketball and in strictly training NBA players. Uh, but I think with the social media world, they hadn't quite meshed the two together. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's sort of uh, what I was able to do is kind of just mesh those two things together and figure out, okay, I can train 50 people in person, but how can I reach 100,000? How can I reach 200,000? And how can I help all of these people? So just kind of how do I, how do I you know, take what they've done, what the Tim Grovers have done, and then just scale it bigger and bigger? Who, who was it that you worked with that you got results that transcended you, that, that, that kind of just catapulted you your business uh everything else along with it so probably the first one would be malcolm lee uh who played at ucla um got drafted i think f late first round or early second round i think he played one or two years for the timberwolves and then he got hurt he um he had a knee surgery and a hip surgery all in the same year and he was doing his rehab he was getting back into strength and conditioning but he just couldn't get that explosiveness back and so he's one of the first people that found me on Instagram and flew out to Arizona and trained with me in this little garage gym. Uh, so I always thank him for giving me that initial trust. Um, but he put seven inches on his vertical in a very short amount of time. It might have been a little over a month, maybe a month and a half. Um, transformed his vertical and got it back to where it was at his prime. Um, and then he actually made it back and he played for the Sixers the next year. Um, so he's overseas right now. But once we got him, that transformation, it kind of started to spread within the NBA circles uh, because the NBA is kind of a, a tight community and everybody knows each other somehow. They all grew up playing club together. And yeah. so, you know, once he got back and people saw that he had his explosion back, I think it really started to spread and more people started to hit me up. Yeah, Malcolm, uh, where'd, where'd, where'd that come from? What's that? <laughs> yeah, Malcolm, where'd that come from? And yeah, then, exactly, and so. exactly. So uh, I would say that that is probably the first guy. Um, and then from there, we really started showing some of our high school kids that were jumping out of the gym. Uh, we showed, we started showing one of our volleyball guys, uh, Cody Martin, uh, who had a 47-inch vertical. And so I think he came to us with like a 43 or 44, and he just kept increasing. One of the best jumpers I've ever seen. He could do it right, left, left, right. I think he, he must have been 6'2", and he was an elite outside hitter. He went on to play at uh, Long Beach State. Um, and so we started kind of showing his transformation, what he was doing, and just people got more and more and more interested. Just what are they doing? What are the methods uh, that are getting these guys crazy results? Yeah, definitely. What's, what's different? Um, so, you know, if uh, those of you that don't know, you, you work with James Harden, uh, prolific player, MVP, uh, potentially two times, two times, two, yeah, time. two time, slight bias there. <laughs> uh, but definitely, definitely. Um, so so how did you get the opportunity to work with James um, and, and what did that do for you? Yeah. So when I was in Arizona, I was graduating actually um, from Arizona State when I had all this going when I'm talking about my early Instagram days. Um, and people, the NBA started to take notice. We started getting people to hit us up and the more people that hit us up, they all said, Hey man, we want to train with you, but we stay in LA in the off season. So we really don't want to go to Arizona when it's 120 degrees in the summer. So enough people had hit me up and kind of, uh, convinced me to go out there. Uh, luckily around that same time I had met up with uh, Matt Kane and Rob Palinka. Rob Palinka is now the GM of the Lakers. 
So I had met up with them. They had found me on Instagram uh, and they were looking for somebody to take care of their guys uh, for strength and conditioning. And so they kind of made the offer that if I move out there, they're going to get their guys in with me. And so I moved out and one of the first guys that I got when I moved was James Harden. Yeah. So he kind of, uh, you know, Rob Polinka called me and said, Hey, James needs a strength and conditioning coach. Uh, he'll give you one trial session. And so I drove out to, uh, Calabasas and I just had my equipment with me. I had bands, I had medicine balls. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't even know if we had a weight room or if we were going to be on a court or, or what the deal was. So we went, we ended up getting in a session on a uh, high school basketball court. We did some band stuff. Uh, I found sort of some, some problems that he had with hip mobility and some different stuff that I wanted to address. And we stopped our session. I quit my plan then and there, and we picked it up with exactly what he needed. And I think he kind of, uh, he, he really appreciated that, that I was tailoring it specifically to him. And these, these athletes are so smart. They're so intuitive. They know what's going on with them. So when a trainer also addresses that, they're like, oh, okay, this isn't just cookie cutter. Like, this is really yeah. what I need. And so we got a good session in. And after the session, he was just like, yo, what's the schedule for the summer? Yeah. So for the, for the casual NBA fan or, or whatnot, they'd look at James and, and not necessarily see, uh, you know, an, an elite athlete. Um, but as you know, uh, from working with him, he, he is an elite athlete. What separates James as an athlete um, compared to the rest of the NBA, as well as his mental preparation? Um, and his, his, his physical preparation. So what separates him from an athleticism standpoint? Well, first of all, you have to expand your definition of athleticism. If you're just looking at jumping and running, then he's probably pretty average. Um, you know, he can jump pretty high. Uh, he, he has some speed, uh, really good fa fast first step. So that's kind of traditional athleticism. But what he does different is his deceleration abilities unreal better than anybody i've ever seen so he could put on the brakes fast um change of pace his ability to contract relax which a lot of athletes don't have uh his balance you know he can spin step back and then get his feet set and get straight up straight down uh, some people look at that and say skill i look at that and say that's athleticism yeah um his stability his full body stability so he could be standing on one leg and you do what what's called perturbations where you kind of knock knock him around or knock the athlete around and he doesn't move. So I've had like NBA centers who outweigh him by 75 pounds who I could nudge and they're going to move. And he, like, you really have to push him to move him. And that's part of, I think, why he's so good at drawing fouls. Like there's an art to it, but also he's so strong that when he drives, you have to give him contact, uh, contact. Otherwise he's going through you. Yeah. Right. And so when you give him that contact, he doesn't move. So you got to give him more contact. And then once you give that to him, oh, OK, I know how to, you know, what the fans would call flop. Yeah. Uh, and somehow that's become a bad thing. Like, why is that a bad thing? Get to the line. That's that's a very good goal. Yeah. Um, but I think part of that starts with uh, with his strength of just how much contact you have to get him to move him. So I think a lot of the fan, you know, the fans look at it as a bad thing. Oh, he's flopping. But you know, from an athleticism standpoint, I think that's where it start is it's, it's just his overall incredible stability, right? Yeah. So strength is your ability to move somebody. Stability is your ability to get hit and not move. So those are a few things. And then also just his general strength. I mean, he's just a strong guy. Um, those, those are things that really separate him as an athlete. And then of course, he's arguably the most skilled or one of the most skilled in the NBA. Yeah. So, you know, you combine those two together and you have a pretty special athlete. Um, from a mental standpoint, from a preparation standpoint, he's very different than probably anybody I've ever coached. Uh, one thing is he's motivated by legacy. He's not motivated by happiness. There's a lot of NBA players. There's a lot of people in general, probably the majority of the world are motivated by happiness and comfort. So it's like once I'm happy, once I'm comfortable, I'm good. I made it to the NBA. I made my million. I made my millions. What else? You know, and, and then you see somebody who's the sixth man of the year go to the MVP. That shows you that it's not happiness. It's not comfort because that's a good achievement. Sixth man of the year in the NBA. And then you're still hungry enough to keep going and keep getting better. So, you know, he, he really is. He's, he's motivated uh, by legacy and not just by happiness. And I've seen the other end of that where we've had a lot of, you know, top 10 picks who didn't necessarily pan out. Um, 
and that's the thing that I notice is they're motivated by happiness. And so the world kind of judges from beyond of like, hmm, you know, why didn't they make it? What are they missing? You can really see it when they're in the weight room. You can see what they're motivated by. And, and, and I can tell right away, if you're motivated by happiness, you're done. Yeah. Because th there's no next step. It's like, it's like Kobe. You're never going to be happy. Like it's always something else. Yeah. It's probably even before the weight room, just what time they even show up. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Hey, Paul, I'm running 15 minutes late. I look at my clock. Okay, yeah, we can work yeah. with that. They should show up an hour and a half late. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, we, we can tell right away yeah, where I've, your motivation I've sat is. I in the gym with you waiting for, you know, we were waiting for somebody to come in and Plenty of 15 fun. minutes after, <laughs> half hour after. And, and obviously, because who we're waiting on, you know, I mean, you, you give that flexibility. But um, then at some point, you know, something's got to flip. And then once you reach the level you were at, I think you were able to actually flip that switch in the opposite direction where, you know, hey, uh, sorry, you missed your workout. I got uh, other things I got to go to now. Yeah. Well, that's probably the biggest luxury, you know, of everything from starting at the bottom and walking around ASU campus with flyers, begging people to come into my gym to where we're at now. Probably the best part of that transformation is not the fame. It's not acknowledgement. It's nothing. It's just being able to say, I want to work with these clients. It's like, if you suck, yeah. <laughs> like not, not as a basketball player, if you suck as a person, if you're not a good fit with me, I can now just say, well, hey, let me refer you out to this guy. Yeah. And then I can pick and choose kind of the guys that really stick, the guys that work hard, the guys that are a good fit for me, and I can run with that. And um, it makes such a big difference in your quality of life. Because when you really care about it and you don't just care about the check, you care about results and you care about relationships. And so if you can pick and choose the guys that really fit with you, it's just a, it's a boost. It, it just, it, it can take you as a trainer to the next level instead of dealing with the, the, the low hanging fruit of like, man, I need your check. Yeah. I need this client because I don't have many NBA players. Uh, that, that kind of stuff can really drain you. So the other thing that I'll say as far as the way James prepares that's very different than anybody else is his imagination is on a whole nother level. So like when we're working out, there will be drills where I'm looking at it as a general strength exercise. Like this is not specific. We're not trying to mimic the game right now, but he finds a way to like make it a game situation. So like when he works out, it's truly like he's in the game. And then you watch him on the court and he's just so intuitive and so natural in his skill sessions. So where one person would just be getting spot shots, catch, shoot, catch, shoot. He's catch and he's like, truly in a game like he's getting to his game moves it looks like he's in a game and, and uh for him it's like actual game reps whereas most people it's practice reps but like you could just see the look on his face like he's truly there he's truly in the game even when he's just in warm-ups or doing skills training so i think that's one thing that really separates him is just his overall imagination whether he's on the court uh, or in the weight room, he could truly be there as if it's game reps. Yeah. And so, so to kind of put that in context for, for these youth athletes or coaches listening, that's one thing that I, as a coach, I say all the time to the kids, I'm like, be imaginative. And I can see as kids are going through reps, which ones are just like, okay, this cone here or this shot here. And the ones that are sitting there and they're actually playing with their imagination with the games. And, and, it, and then it goes to show us, you know, in terms of the quality that they put on the floor. Um, and then even going a step further in terms of his athleticism, what separates him is, you know, like you said, his, his ability to stop. Um, in college, I had a coach that said that was one of the most underrated skills in, in, in basketball was your ability to stop. Right. Um, so if, if you're a kid or you're a coach and you're listening to this right now, you know, pay attention to those little things because, you know what I mean, you could be looking at the 14-year-old you know, James Harden where you, he's not jumping out of the gym and he's not, you know, beating everybody down the hill in the sprints, but he they have those other little separation factors, the imagination, uh, the ability to change speed. Like you mentioned with James in terms of game reps, I think that gets misconstrued a lot in terms of just, oh, I got to go 100 miles an hour. No, not necessarily. You got to be able to imagine what it's like in the, in the realm of a game and put reps in appropriate to that. Right, right. And you might not have the deceleration capabilities. Like I always say that the guys that grew up slow generally have better deceleration capabilities because they had to have it, yeah. right? Like they, they had to get open for shots. So they built some different stuff in their game. Whereas the guys that are fast, it's like, yo, I could always blow by you. Why would I use anything else? So a lot of times you do see the slower guys or the average guys naturally develop that stuff. Uh, but these are all capabilities. These are all qualities that we can enhance in the weight room. Definitely. Right? Whether on the general side, we're looking at eccentric strength for our, for our strength training, uh, rapid isometric training. So what I mean by rapid isometric is think about 
if you were to drop into a squat and you were to drop fast and you catch yourself at the bottom, that's not a long, slow, eccentric. Your muscles aren't on the whole way. Your muscles were relaxed. And then once you hit that bottom position, you rapidly stopped yourself. So that's what I consider a explosive isometric. Um, and that's so, and then for context, like you were mentioning in terms of James having the ability to turn on muscles and turn off muscles at appropriate times, which are separation factors. That's a, that's a way you can train that in the weight room. Yes, yes. And so uh, one step is eccentric training where we are overloading the eccentric, overloading the lowering phase. Uh, but that's on the very general side. I think people, that's when people say, oh, I want to train deceleration. I'm going to overload the eccentrics. That's not going to translate to the core. That's just good general introduction. Uh, I think where we see the biggest results is those explosive isometrics, where we're talking about turn off the muscle, catch yourself at the bottom, and then reverse out of it. And so that's something that we do with strength training. And then I also just look at his moves. I study every single move that he does, and I say, okay, how can we get better deceleration for that move? And so then I'll pull on him with a band from different angles and, and just provide some sort of overload that he wouldn't normally be getting on the court uh, and, and just have him decelerate out of those different moves and then reaccelerate. Definitely, definitely. So it, it is, it's something that can be developed uh, naturally just on the court through playing, uh, but it's also something that can be enhanced in the weight room. Yeah, let's uh, let's transition into the, the most talked about superhuman right now in, 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 in basketball, and that's Zion. Uh, what do you see uh, in terms of, of his athleticism? Uh, obviously, he's a he's an athletic, you know, freak for lack of better words. Um, you know, I know. In for those of you that haven't been on since day one, you put out a post in I, I want to say it was 2011, 2012 ish when when LeBron cramped out of the finals, uh, just about the amount of body mass that he was carrying and that he was trying to sustain for that that long of a you know for an 82 game season plus the playoffs into the finals. Um, you know, Zion is obviously you know a different kind of human. Um, do you see any potential weakness in that? What would you do with him if he came to you for his pre-draft? Would you want to change any of his weight? What would be your first plan of attack? Yeah, so first of all, shout out for remembering that post. That's like a throwback. I got so much crap for that post. People like literally hated me for that. <laughs> Basically what it was, he cramped against, what was it, the Spurs? I believe so, yeah. And I was just talking about, you know, why he was the one that cramped instead of everybody else. He has so much so much muscle mass yeah. and and he produces so much force uh that he is the most likely to cramp compared to everybody else and and people hated me for that post for some <laughs> anytime you post about lebron you're going to be either hated or loved yeah um but anyways getting back to uh zion so if he came to me the question is always how did you get the mass like did you grind in the weight room and did you eat a caloric surplus and like work your butt off to get it or is that just what your body naturally wanted to have did you just grow into that body and from the sources that i have close to him he really just started lifting hard once he got to duke um, so i don't know if that's 100 percent true but that's what i've been told so over his high school career he put on hundreds of pounds or i don't know what the number is i think it was over 100 pounds but he kind of just naturally got that so if your body naturally wanted to have that weight, it's probably there for a reason. Your body doesn't make mistakes like that. So for us to go in and say that our conscious minds are smarter than his body, I think we're crazy. Yeah. So if you're saying, hey, you naturally have that, but we need to strip you down, I think you could have bigger problems on the back end because how do we strip the weight off? Is he fat? He's not fat. He's pretty lean. Yeah. So, I mean, if his body fat is, you know, 15%, you know, 12, 15%, yeah, we could get him a little more lean. For the most part, like you could see the veins in his shoulders. Yeah. So he's super lean. So, okay, how do we strip that weight off? Well, if it came naturally, we're going to have to go into a big caloric deficit and we're going to have to probably cut back on the weight room and not lift. So you might decrease your muscle mass because of that caloric deficit. But in that process... There's so many other systems within the body that we affect. Uh, for example, we're going to weaken his muscles. We're going to weaken his tendons. We're going to weaken his overall joints. So now when you're landing, you're landing with lower total ground reaction force. Yay, we won, right? But you're landing with weaker joints. Yeah. So at the joint level, it's actually more forces, right? So you got to be careful in how you go about doing that. Now, if you said... Okay, he grinded 
in the weight room to gain it and he ate a caloric surplus, then it's okay, let's cut back on the weight room a little bit. Let's train a little different. Uh, let's get to neutral calories. Um, and then let's see what your body naturally does. And so then if his body naturally starts to strip down, great. You know, we didn't compromise the system. We didn't compromise the tendons and the ligaments uh, like we would if we went into some sort of crazy caloric deficit. Yeah. So for me, you know, people sit back and, and tell him, you have to lose weight. The question is always, how did you get it? Yeah. So um, I think he can, you know, I think he can do a good job of staying healthy throughout his career uh, as long as he just maintains a low body fat. You know, he seems like he's the type of guy, the, the type of body type that, you know, if he got some bad habits, if he started eating more and more and more, which people do in the NBA, you now have food available everywhere. You're getting yeah. on team planes with the best food that you could ask for. Uh, so he's the type that could blow up and, and gain body fat. Uh, so he's got to be very tight on his habits. But as long as he keeps his body fat low, I think whatever his body naturally wants to have on the muscle mass standpoint, let him have it. Now, would we train to add mass? No, of course yeah. not. Uh, I think I would train him, as far as strength goes, I would train him more like a gymnast. Like I want you to have all these different positional holds. I want your core to be crazy strong. We would do a lot of different isometric holds, long muscle lengths, short muscle lengths. So getting you stronger at the at the lengths that you are prone to injury. Um, and then we would do a ton of like proprioception, kinesthetic awareness, knowing where your body is in space, different type of agility drills, because that is one of his superpowers is the way he cuts, the way he moves. He's a ninja in the lane. And so we would want to take that and just enhance it, turn yeah. up that volume two times. So... Um, the good thing is he has such a base of pure strength that you could get straight into the good stuff and not have to worry about building them up like we have to do with a lot of our pre-draft athletes. Yeah. For fun, where would you rank him from a, you know, from a viewer standpoint as, as far as athletes all time? One. One. Yeah. It, I, I can't think of anybody else. I mean, LeBron, but no i mean <laughs> like there's really you'd be reaching if you if you ranked anybody higher because the way he cuts the way he changes directions the way he jumps off one leg with that kind of mass yeah. that's insane yeah uh, I, I would expect him to be a good standing vertical jumper because let's face it he's an elite football player who happens to be playing basketball yeah like zion is the athletes that football gets that basketball just doesn't get uh so you, normally they're very powerful and they're good from a standstill position like you see it NFL combine jump in mid forties from a standstill, but then they run and they jump and it's still the same. Like yeah. it didn't go up because they don't have the mechanics. You know, have you ever seen a football player jump? Like m most of them, I know they'll get mad at me, but like most of them run fast and then they just do like this weird, powerful jump stop <laughs> and they wait and then they jump up. Yeah. It's like, why did you even run up? You killed all your momentum. But Zion has that level of power yet he has perfect jump mechanics because he grew up playing basketball. So now he has power and he knows how to tru truly utilize that power and utilize that energy from the run-up and turn it into vertical power. So yeah, he's a football player who happens to be playing basketball. Um, so I, I have to rank him number one. And actually off topic, but I just had a thought. Going back to your question about how would we train him, I mean, what does he need the most going into the NBA? He needs skill. He has the athleticism. He needs skill. So if we said, all right, we got to strip you down. Again, let's go back to how do we strip down natural muscle mass, huge caloric deficit. When players are in a caloric deficit, they do not gain skills. You cannot push through consecutive skill workouts and recover and improve on the court in a caloric deficit. Yeah, and so, I think it's detrimental for long-term health, too. I mean, yeah, you, yeah, detrimental. You, you hear that in the, the fighting community. I mean, Dr. Andy Galpin talks about the exercise physiology in terms of, you know, deficiting, you know, fighters and, and yes. what that does to them in the short term and the long term. And so you're talking yes. about it from an NBA player in the middle of summer. Yes, so. and from the immune system, I mean, you notice more sickness. Uh, there's a lot of things. Um, we have a fat pad in our joints, of course, so... You know, when, when we when we really strip down and we get too far away from our natural body fat, you start having weird joint pain. Your knees are always sore. 
So that's like the worst thing that we could do for becoming a more skilled basketball player. And so that's what I see, you know, if Zion got in with a trainer who was obsessed with stripping him down and put him on a huge caloric deficit, I think you would see him become less and less skilled and actually more injury prone uh, than if you just let his body do what his body naturally wants to do. Yeah. I've seen you get frustrated with that in the summer too, in terms of the relationship also between the the strength and conditioning trainer and the skills trainer in terms of, are you monitoring what he just did in the weight room and the amount of time he just had to recover before you throw him on the court and you throw him in these super high exertion, you know, skills exercises or, 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 or training uh, routines uh, that, you know, perceptionally you feel like you're bringing a lot of value, but in terms of what it's going to give them in, in short term and long term return and what their body's going to be able to adapt to um, you're, you're doing a disservice Yes. So I always say the skills trainer has just as big of a responsibility, actually probably bigger for the long-term injury prevention of the athlete as the strength coach, which seems crazy. You know, you hear strength and conditioning and you think, oh, they're going to get stronger and they're going to prevent injuries, but they're going to spend more total time with the skills coach throughout the whole year. And where you're really pushing your hardest is going to be skills training. So I've asked guys, you know, if you were to go through a hard one hour skills workout, how does that compare to you going out and playing pickup? And they go, the skills workout is five times harder. Like as far as how drained I am after a hard skill workout where you're getting game reps for an hour, you're completely drained. Uh, So the skills trainer really has to understand when to push hard, when to cut back, how to tailor the program for the athlete, because not every athlete can handle the same volume. You know, we look at uh, genetics and we say, well, you know, everybody has a different vertical jump. We look at speed. Everybody starts with different levels of speed, but nobody looks at it and says, everybody can handle a different volume. Some people, you can go the Kobe mentality, five workouts a day, crush them, get through it. There's a lot of other athletes who, if they're in the gym for more than two hours a day, they're going to absolutely break down. So, you know, you try to put everybody in that same bucket of just everybody go hard, go to exhaustion, and then come in the next day and do it again. You're breaking down that athlete. And so then you wonder why they're always getting injured in season. Uh, that can be a huge part of it, of, of how hard they went in the off season. And so the, the strength coach and the skills trainer have to be, you know, they have to communicate um, very frequently and they have to be on the same page as far as what days they're going hard, what days are recovery, and, and, and exactly what each athlete needs. Yeah, and, and to touch on that, I think that can be a lot of value for you know, the levels prior to that, prior to getting the NBA. I think uh, you know, college coaches, high school coaches, um, youth coaches, you know, they'll, they'll glorify that, that overexertion, trying to find out who the toughest kid in the room is. And, and even, you know, and, and it's representative of those levels as well, where you could be doing disservice to your own players and their own production just because you're trying to, you know, gauge this level of toughness that, you know what I mean, mentally and from a passion and desire standpoint, they may have, but, you know what I mean, neurologically and, and physiologically, they just can't produce to the same levels. Um, and so... <clears throat> You know, as you know, those college coaches and the high school coaches that have to do everything inclusive in terms of being the basketball coach and the strength and conditioning coach, I think there can be a lot of value in terms of just understanding, hey, not all players are going to be able to, you know, produce that level of, of, of exertion or, or what have you, but maybe you need to be more aware of each individual athlete and, and tailor things specifically, you know, if your goal is, is, is you know, their, their careers and, you know, and wins and losses. Right. Um, no, 100%. I think... Um, I just think it starts with skills trainers and basketball coaches stepping up and realizing how important their role is in long-term longevity for the athlete because they remove themselves from that. They go, oh, we're just involved with the skill or we're just doing the X and O's. Like we have nothing to do with this athlete staying healthy. Everything is either luck or it's on the strength coach. Uh, But looking from the other side, you got to realize that you are the one really at the end of the day – tailoring their program and, and, and telling them how often they're going to be on the court and how hard they're going to go. So the coach that understands a little bit about the body, you don't have to be a complete scientist. You just got to understand a little bit about the body and a little bit about recovery um, and, and how to get the most out of athletes without pushing them overboard. Yeah, I think that, you know what I mean, kind of goes to the ego complex. It's not about you. It's not about your program or your, your training. It's about the athlete and, and yes. what you can do for them. Yes, Definitely. and like with skills training, Sometimes the player just needs to shoot the ball better. Like, so 
Are you okay with putting your ego aside and just saying, okay, today we're just going to get reps. We're going to monitor those reps. If, if the reps, if the form breaks down, we're going to fix it. But the issue is it's not innovative enough. Yeah. And so they feel self-conscious that the player is going to be like, well, I'm going to go do this because that guy's really getting it in and we're just doing spot shots. But you got to be able to put that ego aside and say, well, this is what you need. So we're going to do this. It's yeah. not innovative in any way. But then you see, you know, the innovative trainers sometimes it's like, I'm going to do a shot. I'm going to do three moves. I'm going to do another shot. I'm going to do four different moves. I'm going to do another shot. And then the player is drained. They're absolutely gassed. So now what are you working on? Fatigued shooting yeah. instead of working on their actual mechanics. And so players might get a little bit better at fatigue shooting, but their mechanics might actually get worse because now you're not actually improving anything. You're just trying to stay alive. You're just trying to keep your head above water and make as many shots as you can. So sometimes it can actually you know, hurt a player uh, long-term, just, just trying to be too innovative in that workout. Yeah. And like I've talked about before, block versus randomized practice. Randomized practice is great. Uh, so that's what's going to actually translate to the court. But block practice is very beneficial, especially when you're working with complex tasks like changing shooting form. Like sit there and just work on the form over and over and over and over again. Don't switch up too many variables. And then once they start to get that down, now add in some different variables. And eventually it can be shot, dribble, shot, come off a screen, shot. You know, you're working in all these different variables and that's what's going to translate. But how you learn form, you're going to be better off in that block uh, structure. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, just being in the in the industry itself, I fe I've felt self-conscious at times as a trainer in terms of like, oh, is, is this enough? I know it because it's monotonous. It's boring because I go back to that bottom line. If if you can't shoot the ball efficiently, then why do I care about you, you know, doing three dribble combo moves, you know, into a step back, right? You're not going to miss the step back. So what was, right. what was the per point of all that? Exactly. But you feel that, you know, as a trainer, it's like, okay, well, everybody else is teaching the three dribble combos into the step back you know, they, that's what they see when they get on Instagram. And so, you know, trying to bridge that gap as a trainer, I think is important. But again, it goes back to that ego. Who are you there for? Yeah. But it's kind of turned into like a funny Instagram battle between <laughs> trainers because you got the guys who get it of like, let's just teach them what they need. Yeah. And sometimes that's just shooting. But then they have to like make an exaggerative statement just to be heard. So then Clay Thompson scores whatever 65 in like two dribbles or whatever yeah. he does and then they go on and they they say well clay did it so why are you doing three dribble combos you know they they give out the stats of how many nba players are scoring in three dribbles or less um so they make these exaggerated claims and then try to make it seem like having a bag isn't important mm -hmm. having a bag is important but it's just the steps to get there. Exactly. I think that's that's the most important part is, is the self-awareness as the player it's yourself and then the coach, you know, with the player that you're working with is in terms of the, the overall progression is, okay, if you're starting with a kid that already has the jump shot in the form, then of course, you know, expand the bag as much as possible. But if you're starting with a kid that, you know, the more bag you give him, he's still going to end up missing the, missing the jump shot or not being able to, to finish after the move, then what's the point? Yeah. But I will say on the other side of the argument of why we need a bag if I shot 100% right now, but I didn't have my handle, I didn't have the quickness, I didn't have the bag, do you think I could be effective at the NBA level? Have you ever seen a 5'11", oh, no. 3 and D guy? No. Have exist. you ever even seen a 6'2", 3 and D guy? Like, they're not there. No. <laughs> yeah. So, Clay, it works because you're 6'7". Yeah. So you could be a 3 and D guy at 6'7", but there's no such thing. And 99% of the world is going to be under 6'2". Yeah, I actually think that's an, that's an entire two-hour long podcast in terms of the evolution of the game. You yeah. know what I mean? In terms of, of, of now, to be, at, to be at the NBA level, you have to be able to do absolutely, you know, everything in terms of having that superpower, like Clay, if it's shooting, but then also still be able to, you know, come off a down pick, ha handle the ball if necessary, play defense. Um, be an asset in all areas where, um, you know, I think there's uh, a misconception in terms of where the game's at now and where the players are at now in terms of where it was 20 years ago. Um, and just with those things is, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. But it, 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 it's kind of a funny, like, Instagram battle. Yeah. <laughs> like, do we need a bag or do we not need a bag? Yeah. We do need a bag. It's how do we get that bag? Exactly. Do we have a, a hierarchy in our training of, like, these are the things that really matter. We need these and then let's get that. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely back to uh, back to, you know, the, the strength and conditioning side uh, in terms of, you know, uh, expanding a bag there. What do you think are the, the, the three most overrated vertical jump exercises to bring some value to the, to, you know, to that community? So 
there's so many. <laughs> there's so many that people are doing on a daily basis that are just so pointless. So I'll start with the one that I hate the most. And this isn't a very popular opinion, but this is the one that I hate the most. Uh, barbell jump squats. So that is barbell on your back, you're loading up the weight, and you're jumping and you're landing. So everything we do in strength and conditioning, the good strength coaches, the first question you always ask is what is the benefit and what is the risk? There is no significant benefit that we can't get with another form of loaded jumps. So there is no benefit that we're going to get from jump squats that we can't get from a trap bar jump. Actually, with a trap bar jump, we have the option of no eccentric loading. We could get the concentric power, and then on the landing, we can drop the bar. Or we can slowly, or we can lower it down so that the, the, the floor absorbs the weight instead of your knees absorbing the weight. Now, not saying that a catch on the eccentric is bad. Sometimes we want that. But again, you have that decision. So with a trap bar, we could catch it and get those eccentric forces, or we can drop it. Uh, barbell back squat position, we can't do that. So you're jumping, and, and if you don't have a trap bar, you can load the same way just with dumbbells. So two dumbbells down by the side, or one dumbbell um, kind of in the sumo squat position, holding by the head of the dumbbell. There's so many different ways to load powerful triple extension and jump that are much safer uh, than that barbell back squat position. So the, the issue for me is there's no significant benefit beyond what you could do with another exercise. And the risk is very, very high. Yeah. So you're literally loading up a bar and you're jumping and you're landing and we're getting all of those compressive forces to the spine. So if it's not an immediate injury, that's just something that could take a toll long term. Yeah. So why get that excess stress to the joints? And I'm fine with taking risk. I'm fine with taking risk, but there's got to be a significant benefit. Yeah. So if you if you're doing the, the the barbell back squat jumps, then you know have some responsibility in terms of why you're doing what you're doing. If yes. you're a coach, you know, uh, you know, designating that, or if you're an athlete just trying to get the vertical up, there's better ways. There's better ways, and I just don't think that there's any situation that I would ever use it because for to get the most out of a vertical jump exercise, what do we need? We need max intent. You yeah. got to go all out. So if I'm going all out with a barbell on my back, the only thing on my mind is jump as high as I can. I can't have anything else at the forefront of my conscious mind, right? Like you can't hold two pieces of data at once and truly focus on those two yeah. pieces of data. Like you're driving and you're looking for an address. What do you do? Turn down the music yeah. <laughs> because you don't want to have too many different yeah. points of data in, in the forefront of your mind. And so what like the good coaches who would teach it would say, okay, engage the lats. So we engage the lats so that we keep that barbell down. Well, if I'm truly getting max intent, engage the lat is thrown out, Yeah. right? So I'm getting max intent and I'm jumping. And now if I don't have the lats engaged for every rep, that barbell floats and then we land and that barbell comes down. So it might not be on your mid traps anymore. That might be coming down on your neck. Yeah. Or every hooper has experienced this. How many times have you had it in a game where you jump and then in the air, your calves cramp? Yeah. And it's like, you don't know how to land. Like you just kind of flop to the floor. What if that happens when I'm in the air with a barbell on my back? I collapse down with that barbell and you yeah. have a spinal cord injury. I don't mess with the spine. If, yeah. if, if, if you're asking yourself as a strength coach, okay, what happens if it goes wrong? And that's always your question for every exercise. What happens if it goes wrong? And if the answer is significant spinal cord injury, I'm moving away <laughs> yeah. from that. And also ironically enough on the way here, um, when I was sitting there and I was waiting, I was on Instagram and I saw I saw barbell back squat jump. It's everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere. Yeah. So I think I, I think this is the issue. I think it's been shown in the studies to improve vertical jump, but that doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. Yeah. That means it was the easiest way to do it. it it's a very simple way for the researchers to load a triple extension. It's very simple. They don't have trap bars laying around or they're not innovative enough to think about alternatives with dumbbells. And so it's just something that's been studied over and over and over again. If you study something over and over and over again enough, you're going to find a result. Yeah. So it doesn't mean it's the best way. It just means that that's how a lot of researchers have studied that exercise. Yeah. So I think too many trainers really just rely on what the studies show without critically thinking. And without saying, well, hmm, I wonder why they got that result. And I wonder if there's a way that we could get that same result uh, with without the risk. 
Yeah. And that's why like, it's great that we have EMG and force plates because when I have those questions, I just go test it. I go, okay, can we get the same power output with a trap bar? And then I go test it. The answer is yes. So, you know, I think, I think people are too quick to uh, jump on the bandwagon just because a study shows something. Yeah, I think there's also just a huge... Uh, issue with just taking the shortcuts where you'll read the headline of a study and then you'll yes. be like, oh, okay. And that, that was one thing I learned, uh, you know, as well as just, you know, qualifying your information, you know, qualify the study, qualify the research. And I actually think that's that's part of why you've been able to continue to separate yourself just because like what you said, you don't qualify the research in terms of where it came from. You just go in and you repeat the same study for yourself and, you know what I mean, and then change a variable of the study and, and see what the results come and, and, and know, again, results oriented. Yeah. I mean, we kind of just have a system where I try something on myself and then if I like it, I try it on an intern. <laughs> and if, <laughs> if it went well, then we might try it on an athlete. And if that went well, it climbs the ladder. Yeah. And eventually it might reach an NBA player. Uh, but everything is tested. It's not like guess and check. We're not just like, you know, trying something new on an NBA player. You know, everything is tested. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, exercise overrated number two. <laughs> Ooh, high box jumps. Oh, definitely gosh. high box jumps. It's just... It's, it's everywhere on Instagram. Um, so what's the point of a box jump in general? The point is to decrease the stress to the knees uh, because, you know, there's when, when we land from a jump, so if I'm on the floor and I jump and I land, I have all the forces coming down from the height that I dropped from. So when you jump to a box, you now decrease that. You don't have the same eccentric landing forces. So... Uh, that's why box jumps are popular in the first place. Now, again, we want eccentric stress. So sometimes we got to move that box aside and jump and land on the ground because that's how we get it in the game. So we got to expose the body to those eccentric stresses. Anyways, when we're trying to decrease that stress to the knees, then we jump to a box. So then it kind of, over time, I guess, just became a competitive thing mm -hmm. where everybody's just like, well, if I could jump on that box, I wonder if I could jump on that exactly. box. And we've had athletes in our gym all the time, you know, come up to me. I actually had a parent approach me once and they're like, you know, my son can jump on like the 36 inch box, but you have him jumping all on the, the 24 inch box. He's like, I think you're, you might be holding them back. And like, no, because when he lands on the 24 inch box, he's, he's not doing it in a quarter squat position. He's landing in a half squat. So if I put him on the 36 inch box, he's going to land in a deep squat position. And he's going to take a lot of excess stress to the patellar tendon. Um, and he's going to have some issues. So the whole point of jumping on to a box was now removed because we're actually increasing his landing stresses. So, and then the, the bigger risk, the immediate risk of is you just jumping and clipping your foot and falling back, yeah. which you see the gym fails all the time. Yeah. Which again, I think that, you know, now we got these padded plow boxes and stuff like that. That risk has kind of been detracted. So now it's only overemphasized the desire to jump on as high a box as you possibly can. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, that's one thing like you should be landing in a quarter squat position. If you're landing with your thighs more than parallel, like deeper than parallel, you're jumping on a box that's way too high. Yeah, It's it, like we always just tell our athletes, jump and float, yeah. jump and float and come down to the box. Like you don't want to barely be getting on that box. Now, there is value for fear in training, <laughs> right? We've probably talked about this before. Uh that's where I like high box jumps is that when you're going to jump on a high box, you have this like this this like gut reaction of if I don't get this, I'm gonna die. <laughs> and because of that, you kind of you kind of gear up, you kind of get that adrenaline going. Now, we found better ways to do it where you still get that adrenaline and you still get that increased performance because of the safety reasons. Uh, but you don't have to die if you fail. Yeah. So we we now buy collapsible hurdles. So we'll get that that hurdle up as high as you can, and you still get that same gut reaction. Like if I trip over this, I'm going to die. But when you do hit it with your foot, it just flies away and nothing happens. Yeah. But every time they go to jump, they still get that same gut reaction. So you still get your adrenaline up. Um, I I initially started messing around with that concept. Uh, I I read like a T Nation article. It must have been like. 10 years ago and he was talking about pull-ups and he's like okay you know how long could you hold a pull-up position 
And I think everybody's like, I don't know, you know, 20 seconds. Okay, what if there's alligators beneath you snapping? Oh, man, five minutes, yeah. right? So like that safety, you know, puts you into a whole uh, different zone. So I think sometimes you can incorporate that with your training. It's just the training can't ever actually be dangerous. Yeah, the methodology, it has be, the programming. It has to be fake fear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you got to find ways to just like put that fear in you. But if <laughs> worse comes to worse, nothing actually happens. Yeah, so same thing. If you're, if you're a coach, take the responsibility of, of making sure it's safe. If you're, if you're the one doing it, you know. Yeah. Re-engineer it. Again, exactly. that's another epidemic of mass proportions. I was actually in the weight room last week and our football team was in there and they, you know, testosterone fueled competitiveness, stacking the box up higher and higher. And I was trying not to be disrespectful and then finally had to interject. I'm like, look guys, like you're doing nothing except for setting yourself up for long-term failure. Yeah. So another yep. one. Yep. Uh, what about three? We said three. So there's so many directions I could go with this. I'll say maximally loaded back squats. Maximally loaded back squats. I just had a, a, a IGTV post on this. Um, definitely check that out because I went pretty in depth on that. But maximally loaded back squats for the vertical jump. Now, if you're a football player where slow force matters a little bit more, it might make some sense. And what I mean by slow force matters a little more is if you have another football player hanging from you, right? Wrapping you up and hanging from you. And now you're trying to drive. You're trying to keep your legs going. Your ground contact time is significantly slowed down. So now you're not in the point one, point two, like when you're sprinting or cutting. Now your ground contact, it's like you're running in mud. Mm -hmm. So ground contact times might be closer to a second. So slow force can actually be utilized if you have another human hanging from you. So it makes a little bit more sense for like a football player who's training, uh, to, to keep their legs moving and they have to go through another human body. Now for vertical jump and for speed, just doesn't make sense. It's about force in 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0 0.4 seconds. So the force that you're utilizing in a squat where it takes you three or four seconds to get up, that's too slow. Contraction velocity is just not the same. So we always look at like people, you know, strength coaches say all that matters is max intent. So when you're loaded up heavy, as long as we have the intent to get up fast, then you're you're going to get the right adaptation. But you're not because you're because the contraction velocity of the muscles is just too slow. And the studies over and over again have shown uh, that strength gains are highly velocity specific. So we're significantly improving our ability to produce force, but it's produced force at three seconds, at two seconds, right? It's not at 0.4 seconds. It's just too fast. So I'm not saying squats are bad. But I would rather see you, uh, quick tip, I'd rather see you put a time limit on everything. So uh, instead of, a, if you were at like a 90 to 100% of your max squat and you were driving through it, it would probably take you three seconds. For maximal power in a squat, I would rather see you get up in 0.5 seconds. So you don't necessarily have to have the velocity tracker, but if you set up your phone or you had somebody time you, it doesn't have to be completely accurate, but just ha just having that mindset of I got to get up in a certain time frame. So how much weight can I put on the bar and still get from the bottom to the top in 0.5 seconds? So for me at 5'11", at 0.5 seconds from bottom to top, thighs parallel to full extension, it's 0.8 meters per second. Highest power output is, depending on the study, 0 0.8 or 0 0.9. So now if you're taller, that might change. But like if you're 5'11", that's a good guide. Aim for 0.5 seconds. Statistically, that's going to be your highest power output. Now, I'm cool with getting more into the, the max strength, the absolute strength side. Um, but still, you got to have... A, a time frame goal. So like have a friend time you. If you're getting from bottom to top, thighs parallel to top in longer than a second, it's wasted. Yeah. There's no way that you can apply that force ever in sports. So load up. So your new maxes, instead of these viral videos where you're like slapping each other and chanting, everything has to be on a time frame. So your new max is how much total weight can I lift in one second? Yeah. If I did it in 1.2 seconds, that doesn't count. That's not my max. I have to go down. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a perfect science unless you have the velocity tracker, but like start to get in that mindset of like, we're just beating our bodies down with these heavy back squats and that slow force is never going to transfer. And if we are trying to expose the body to maximal force, 
there's better ways to do it at a lower cost of doing business. So like, you know, in the vert code, we do uh, the isometric mid thigh pull. So we go in, in the rack and we pull as hard as we possibly can. On the force plates, I reach much higher of a peak force and an average force than I ever could in a heavy back squat. But I didn't have any weight on my back. So I could finish an isometric mid thigh pull, activate all of my muscle, fast switch muscle fibers, hit a higher peak force, and still have energy to now go do the good stuff. Now I can go do other strength training, uh, higher velocity strength training. Now I can get into plyometrics. I still have energy and I'm good to go. Whereas if I went 90 to 100% back squat, I'm beat down. Like that was my meat and potatoes. Yeah. So you just did your meat and potatoes lift that actually doesn't even transfer anyways. So at the end of the day, what are we really doing? So yeah, so if you're, you know, in terms of overrated exercise, uh, heavy back squat, um, or, you know, understanding again, the purpose, you know, if you're a coach or you're a trainer, um, understanding the purpose uh, for the athlete, if you're a basketball, basketball or volleyball, you're looking for the, the vertical jump output, understanding that there's different methods uh, to get a better equitable result. Um, rather than just loading up a bunch of weight on the back and, and, right. and seeing how much right. you can push. And if you have to, if you really feel like you just got to gotta lift super heavy, first of all, it shouldn't be a KPI, key performance indicator. That's where people go wrong is they make that the goal. Mm-hmm. They get away from the true goal and then you beat up the athlete because you're, you place so much of an emphasis on that. If you feel like you really need to get that max strength and you don't want to do isometrics because you think it's angle specific, which it is, but we can work multiple angles. Anyways, we can do rear foot elevated split squat and expose the lower body to more total force because in the back squat, the lower back is going to be your limiter, Mm -hmm. not your lower body. So we can still get the same qualities, probably a little bit better from a rear foot elevated split squat or from a trap bar deadlift without having that additional load. Again, same benefit with lower risk. So I, I think, I think the squatting is the king. Back squats are the king has always been Uh, what's passed down from coach to coach, I think you really got to rethink that and just realize that there's so many other ways to go about doing this. And I don't know if you saw what I posted on Instagram recently about, we did the EMG studies uh, with the back squat and the vertical jump. And we showed that the glutes actually uh, functioned the exact opposite in the squat than in the vertical jump. So in the squat, you hit a peak force uh, with a flexed hip when your knees are around 90 degrees. And then as we rise through the top, the, the glute activation goes lower and lower and lower. In the vertical jump, it starts lower. And as we reach an extended hip, it gets higher and higher and higher. So then at toe off, like right when my toes are leaving the ground, that's when it hits its highest uh, activation. So they're actually the exact opposite. Now we could fix that a little bit by using accommodating resistance so bands and chains where the resistance is harder at the top because traditionally if you don't use accommodating resistance the top half is easy so you get lower muscle activation near the top Mm -hmm. Um, and in traditional lifts in general you have a deceleration phase because you're being told i gotta drive hard but i don't want my feet to leave the ground so at some point you got to slow yourself down Whereas in the jump, it's like, I got to go all out and really power myself through triple extension. Yeah. So, you know, the, the coaches who say, well, the vertical jump is very similar to the back squat because it looks the same. What's going on inside the body is not the same in any way. Um, so, yeah, so the back squat has its place, um, but it's not a direct translation to vertical jump. Therefore, you shouldn't be going into a back squat saying, now I'm going to increase my vertical with this. Yes. Exactly. Um, so uh, on on uh, so we we went to top three overrated exercises for for vertical. Um, what do you think is is trendy and new in NBA strength and conditioning? Trendy and new. Um, you know, there's a lot. I think every year something new pops up, and because it's trendy and because it's on social media, everybody just hops on board because you're like, well, I don't want to be left out. Yeah. All these other guys are doing it, so. Uh, One thing that is trendy and new, I think in the last like three years is going towards the vegan diet, uh, which we could get into a full (laughs) debate here. So uh, Skylar is vegan and we're we're not even going to get into this today because this could get deep. Yeah. And and, and let me touch on that real quick, uh, because because, yes, I've been vegan for two years and four months now, but I'm, I'm, I'm a constant learner and I don't think 
And I think that's, you know, important for, for any field in, in nutrition to, to performance to strength and conditioning is that you have to devoid yourself from your ego or whatever you've committed yourself to and be willing to input new information. Um, so I was actually having a conversation with my wife last night who's also vegan in terms of I may be expanding outside of that in terms of realm of, of what's going to be optimal for overall performance. Uh, I think uh, in terms of, of diet and nutrition um, because of the American diet is so uh, centered on just absolute crap, uh, that when you make those extreme diet changes, it can have huge, huge physiological, uh, changes and, 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 and therefore benefits from a performance standpoint. However, you have to be aware of, of the long-term effects as well as, you know what I mean? Areas where you saw performance benefits, but maybe areas where you're not recognizing where you, where you may be losing or lacking. Um, right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I had, to, I had to throw that disclaimer out. <laughs> obviously, you've grown over time yeah. because when you first went vegan, yeah. it was like, that's the only way, Yeah, right? It was like you wanted to tell everybody. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think part of that is because of, of, of again, just information is, is when something, when a wave kind of hits, you know what I mean, the, the, the contrast of, of information and, and studies aren't as out yet. So I think, you know what I mean, in the last three years, like you said, it's become a lot more popular. And because of the last three years, there's been a lot more people like, hey, wait a minute, there could be more efficient ways of doing this instead of just going to that level of extreme. Yeah. Uh, but definitely when it when it started, yeah, I was, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was like, way. hi, my name is Skylar and I'm vegan. That was <laughs> yeah. like the first thing yeah. that you mentioned to everybody. Yeah. Uh, no, and, and so I kind of, because of that, I kind of did my research on it and I actually went vegan for a couple months tried it out. I didn't love it. And so I kind of switched back. I went to, uh, vegan after six. So, uh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, I was a vegan before six. Oh, okay. So from 6am to 6pm, I was a vegan because I did like how it, it kind of didn't weigh me down. I felt good. Like I could eat a lunch and then I could go into my sessions or I could go train without being weighed down. But like 6 p.m. comes around and I felt like I just needed like real protein. Like not that vegan isn't uh, real protein. It is. But like I just needed a quick meal that really just like hit it and and satisfied my cravings. Yeah. Um, and I did lose some muscle. But it's because, you know, you can absolutely be a vegan. It just takes a lot more planning. Mm -hmm. You, know, you got to pair things the right way. Uh, whereas you can kind of be like on the go and lackluster on your diet and still get enough easy, readily available protein um, through through animal based products to where if you're if you're like me and you're always on the go, it just made more sense for me to to have some meat in my diet. Um, so, yeah, we won't get into that too much because that could be a, another good debate. But I will say that that's probably one of the big trends. I think uh, Kyrie went vegan. Mm -hmm. I think Damian Lillard messed around with it a little bit. There's a lot of guys that are kind of going in that direction. Uh, but then now that it's like three years in where that trend hit, you're kind of starting to see guys get out of that. Yeah. And, and a lot of guys saying they couldn't maintain muscle mass through the season. Uh, so they're doing it some days or they're doing it a little bit in the off season, uh, but during season, they're still eating meat. Yeah. And I, and I think from what I've learned in terms of just studying and then in, and continuing to keep an open mind um, is, is that's exactly the approach you should take. The bioavailability in terms of nutrients uh, from 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 uh, animal sources is just far easily easier digestible. Um, you get the nutrients quicker. Um, so therefore, your body's going to respond quicker. Um, and then you need that full spectrum. So, you know, what I mean, Dr. Graham, who's a, you know, MD. Uh, Harvard, uh, you know, doctor, um, he says, you know, plant slanted, um, and then conscious carnivore, you know, is, is mm -hmm. the best, most optimal approach in terms of performances is, is you, you know, there's a place for, 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 you know, animal, you know, products. Um, but the sourcing of it is, is important. Um, so if you're a high level athlete, obviously you have the resources to, to kind of make those things, you know, uh, tangible and then, you know what I mean? But then leaning heavily plants, you know, as, you know, as you know, you, you coined the term, you know, fat doesn't fly. So in terms of keeping a low body weight and stuff like that, the caloric, uh, intake of, of, of plants relative to animal products is, is significantly different. Um, right. so, yeah. And I mean, it, it also just helps because these guys, at the NBA level, they are eating microwave pizzas. Yeah. And like they are eating bad food. We assume that because they have the resources and the money to eat healthy and nutritionists and all this stuff that uh, they have these perfect diets, but it's not true. So sometimes you get rid of that and you say, okay, I'm vegan. Well, now when I get into a city late at night, there's no McDonald trip, yeah. you know? So you, you're kind of, you're limited in what you could do. So it's, it's, um, it's a diet that works by elimination for a lot of these guys. Yeah, definitely. But a lot of these guys 
just don't do the planning mm-hmm. to really go vegan and really get performance benefits from it and be sustainable. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to do it, you got to really, really plan and, and, and know where, know where you're going with it. So I, I'll say that that's one of the trends is people kind of messing with their diet, which I love. I love that people are at least being conscious mm-hmm. about their diet. Um, you know, whether you're going vegan or you're not, or you're do, whatever you're, whatever it is, at least you're being conscious about it. You know that what we eat significantly impacts how we play and how we feel. Yeah, I think that's another testament too, just towards the overall evolution of the game and the player. From you know, what I mean, we talk about from a performance standpoint, from a skill standpoint, but even them being conscious of what they're putting into their bodies now, from a diet standpoint, a lifestyle standpoint, just shows you know the the evolution of of you know of trying to be the best. Right. So, you know, new information and then new practice. Yeah. And I will say, even from like when I got into the industry, there were still a lot of players. You'd be surprised. There's still a lot of players who, one, they're not looking at their diet, but they don't take strength and conditioning that serious. It's more so like just something they do every now and then for a little bit of maintenance. But like you still had guys like, uh, you know, Jamal Crawford, who's just like, I just want to hoop. (laughs) <laughs> like just get me in a pickup game. I'm trying to hoop. Like he never did serious strength and conditioning. And there were, there were a lot of people, Alan Iverson never yeah. lifted a weight. He said, that shit's too heavy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Best quote ever. But, uh, there's still a lot of those guys. Now I honestly don't know one guy. I know a lot of NBA players. I don't know one guy that doesn't take strength and conditioning serious. Mm-hmm. And whether that's because they, they understand the performance benefits or because they see all of the injuries and they're like, well, look, my health is my wealth. Mm -hmm. And if I'm healthy and I don't get a serious injury, that could prolong my career. I could sign a whole nother contract. That could be the difference between me being wealthy and generational wealth. Yeah. Right. So like there, there's levels to it. And so I think, uh, I think players are starting to understand that. So you see, that's probably the number one trend that I've seen over the last five years is just every player is now very, very conscious about strength and conditioning and starting to be more conscious about their diet. Yeah. Who do you think gets gets kind of credit for that in terms whether it's whether it's players that kind of like okay you know I'm gonna take the initiative and you know other players seeing them take the initiative and okay well if they're doing it I, I better hop on as well or you know what I mean but. I think it's that I think a lot of it starts with the coaches and the trainers uh, traditionally we don't do a good job of communicating like we read the studies we understand the benefits, but we don't meet them halfway. And so there's so many strength coaches that are knowledgeable. They can't get the buy-in from an athlete just because the way they communicate it, it's, they just can't get people excited about it. Uh, but there's some strength coaches out there that are very good communicators and they can get it across in a way that the players understand. And then that gets them in the door. And then once you get that buy-in, you start to see results. Yeah. Any other trends we want to touch on? Uh, probably the last trend is, how much you play in the off season. So you're starting to see that come back a little bit. Like not that players stopped, but I think that for a couple years, the notion was that if I play in the off season, I'm going to run my body down. I'm going to play too much. And then I got to go play 82 games. But the issue, and I think what people realize is that the only way to truly get in shape for basketball is playing basketball. It's too dynamic. Cut, run, jump, backpedal, you know, the mental components that's going on, the loading speed of the of the tendons, of the muscle, uh, the unpredictability in it, it can't be uh, replicated in the weight room. So we're gonna try, but we're never gonna truly prepare you. So I look at playing in the off season as injury prevention. It's, prep, it's prepping you for the season. Last thing you wanna do is not play basketball at all, just get in the weight room, do your conditioning separate, and then go into training camp where all of a sudden you're playing hours a day. You're getting up and down, you're beating yourself up, and then the next day you got to go do it again. So a lot of times the damage that's acquired in training camp surpasses what the damage would have been had you just played all off season. Yeah. So I think that's one thing you start seeing like the UCLA runs start to pick up and um, a a lot of people are playing now and I push our guys to play. Uh, But just like in the weight room, everything is progressively overloaded. So when we're building the fit, the the base right after they get done with season, I don't really want them playing much. If, if if they want to play one-on-one or play three-on-three or something light, great. 
but for mo- for the most part, it's just strength and conditioning and some skills training, you know. And then as the summer progresses, okay, let's add one pickup game per week, and then eventually two pickup games per week. They might get up to the point before training camp where they're playing three times a week, whether that's two five on five games and one one on one, or three five on five, whatever it is. We just want to progressively overload it so that we can get into training camp and training camp just feels like another day. You know, it's those days where, you know, you know how it feels as a hooper. You haven't played in a long time. You go out, you play. The next day you have soreness in like the weirdest muscles, like your back is extremely sore, uh, the sides of your shins. Like there's weird areas where that we don't train in the weight room uh, or that we can't really replicate in the weight room that are sore. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's that damage of like waking up and feeling like you can't move. The, the, the damage accumulated in those days, I think, far surpasses uh, the damage that would have been accumulated had you just stayed in shape and played. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think that's one trend. I think players are starting to realize that you can't truly replicate uh, basketball in strength and conditioning. You can't just go run, right? Like the studies on how, how many calories you actually burn when the brain is activated versus when it's not activated. Yeah. Yeah. The stressors. So it's like, I heard one quote, uh, they're saying, you know, you step on the stage or, or if I'm talking to you right now, my heart rate's not elevated. I'm relaxed. If I step on stage and talk in front of a thousand people, now my heart rate's way up. I might be sweating. So you know, I, at the physiological level, like I'm burning more energy, not because of physical activity, but because now the, the stressors. Yeah. Uh, so my brain is so much more activated and I'm so much more amped up. Uh, so, you know, we can't really replicate that in training. And so I think, uh, getting out and playing and, and using your pickup games, uh, as a form of injury prevention is actually becoming a trend. And it's a trend that I love because I don't want to see you have to start uh, from, from ground zero in, um, in, in the preseason. Yeah. When you break it down logically and into pieces, it just makes sense too. just the translation. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's still like, I still have this argument with players from time to time because Mm -hmm. they're like, well, I don't want to damage my body. Like I play so many games uh, but, but when you break it down like that, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like if I want to get better at the task and if I want to be resilient for the task, I have to do the task. Yeah, exactly. You know, like if you, it's like, uh, if you're a UFC fighter and you get kicked in the shin, big deal. You've been getting kicked in the shin. If I get kicked in the shin, I snap. Yeah. <laughs> like, like my, my shin might snap in half because like I haven't had that exposure over and over and over again. Yeah. So yeah, anything that you want to get better at or be resilient for, you got to do the task. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, self-awareness as players too, understanding just the amount of minutes that you're getting in the regular season, you could probably, you know, do do yourself a lot of justice just taking that route in the off season. Just right. How much can I grow? Right. Yeah, and, and players got to be super, like you said, they got to be super self-aware about their minutes and who they are as mm-hmm. players. Like, James Harden's usage rate is so high. The, the How much movement he does in a game, how much beating he takes in a game. Like people really could never wrap their head around yeah. it. To, to do that night in and night out and not do not be on load management yeah. like, like the rest of the league and to be healthy for that long, you know, that's really, really tough. Like people don't understand like the pain that he pl- uh, plays through. And so come off season, he's going to have to get some rest. And we got to be very diligent in our workouts. Yeah. Like if we're like, well, hey, we want to improve your vertical, so let's go do a bunch of plyos. Boom, 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 beating him down more and more and more. So, uh, you know, we got to be very careful in how we rebuild the base, make him into a better uh, functioning human, and then we gradually get more into the higher intensity training. Uh, But, you know, if you just went out and trained like anybody else, you would really damage your body because his usage rate is so high. Whereas the guy who gets 10 minutes a night, you know, they can come in and they can really start. We always rebuild the base and start light. I do that with all of our athletes, but you know, we can get into the higher intensity stuff and do that throughout the summer Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, they're not playing as much. So we don't have to kind of pull back as much as we have to on the superstar players. Yeah. And it can position them, you know, come, you know, training camp that, you know, Hey, you know, I grew a lot. I was, you know, was going from 10 minutes a game to I played 40 minutes a game the entire summer. Yes. You know, look where I'm at now as yes. a player. And that's the other thing. That's the other, actually, since we're talking about uh, uh, trends in the NBA, IG videos, IG workout yeah. videos. That's, that's the thing now, like it's <laughs> full on 
like c- cinematic videos now. Yeah. It's no longer cell phone videos. Like you got your professional videographer coming to shoot your workout. Most people hate it. I love it. Because if you're an NBA player, what do you have in common with the average fan? These average fans love you. But what do you have in common? Not that much. Like you're very, very different. You're super skilled. That other guy might not be that skilled at anything. But what you have in common is grind, work ethic. Like they might not have the same work ethic. But if they want to achieve their goals, they have to grind. And so if you can put out a workout video, not saying, hey, I'm just this good. It's like, hey, this is how I got here. That's so relatable for the average fan. And so from a branding standpoint, for a player, it makes a ton of sense. The more you can relate with your fans, the deeper the connection, the more jersey sales, you know, everything increases, the more they can relate to you. Uh, But just from an impact standpoint of like, how do I influence the community and influence the people looking up to me? You don't influence them as much as you would think going out and scoring 50. Yeah. Because how does that influence their weekend? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if, you, if I want to influence your weekend, I'm going to show you how I got here. And mm-hmm. I'm going to motivate you to go out and grind towards your goals. So I love it. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, as a fan, I think I, you know I mean? In terms of once I got into the circle and started, you know, was a, around NBA training and, and saw the grind that these NBA players, you know, uh, put themselves through in the off season, you know what I mean? And then coming back to watching that next season, my appreciation of a fan was, was 10 times greater than it had yeah. ever been before. And so, yeah, I think that's... And as a fan, it just makes you love basketball exactly. that much more. I think it, it's twofold. It works. It benefits the fan and it benefits the player. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So that's that's one of the trends uh, that most people hate, but I actually like, mm-hmm. uh, is, is players posting their workout videos. Okay, let's round back and, and, and uh, try and bring some value to, uh, you know, the, the youth athletes or the high school kids, the college kids, um, and, and just something base that they can understand. Uh, flexibility, good, bad, where's, where's the line? Uh, what, what should we be aiming for in terms of vertical jump? What's, what's too much? So there's a lot of different tests. Like in the Vert Code Elite and in the Vert Code, in the videos tab, we have a full assessment, basically a self-assessment where – You know, you don't have to have an advanced biomechanist to do this test. Like you just do this by yourself and it shows you if you're in range and if you need more or if you if you need less. But first of all, let's just attack the myth that more flexibility is better. It is not. So we've done we've tried to look for this correlation. Like I always thought that eventually we are going to find a correlation between flexibility in a certain muscle group and vertical jump performance. Never found it. Uh, some of the athletes that we have that jump the best are actually very tight. Um, you know, some of them are super flexible. Some of them are super tight. There's, we've never found a correlation. I, I've dug pretty deep in the research. I've never been able to find a correlation in the research either uh, between vertical jump and flexibility. So what it comes down to is we need enough to get into the ideal positions. Anything more than that might be a waste. So... The ideal positions for the vertical jump, you know, I talk about patient heels, patient ankles. So that means we drop down to the bottom of our jump. Some people are so limited in the ankle that the knees start to translate. Well, always in a jump, your knees are going to translate over your toes. Uh, But at that point where your knees translate over the toes, we come to the forefoot. So we're now off our heels in the bottom of our jump. What I have found is a lot of really good jumpers, uh, and it depends on Achilles length, but a lot of really good jumpers can keep that heel down all the way until we transition out of that bottom and we start to come up and you get closer to a 60 degree knee angle. So a lot of the best jumpers are getting at a 60 degree knee angle and then the heels come off the floor. So then the ankles are acting as a whip. So it's amplifying all of the forces higher up in the chain. Whereas if I just come to my forefoot at the bottom, it's now just a push to the finish. The ankles are amplifying what's happening higher up in the body. Now it's every man for himself, every joint for itself, push to the finish, which if you're crazy strong, like a lot of football players, you know, they get by and they still jump 40 inches. Uh, But most of the basketball players who jump really, really high, they have those patient ankles. So Achilles length matters. Like I'll never, I have a short Achilles, I'll never be able to get my knees to that 60 degree knee angle. Like I'm always barely going to transition out of the hole of the vertical jump and my heels are going to start to rise because it's all about when you create tension in the Achilles. So if you have a short Achilles, you're not going to be able to stay as patient. If you have a long Achilles, you're going to be able to stay patient. But 
if you're limited in the ankles, if you have really bad ankle mobility, you're always going to be coming to the forefoot earlier and earlier and earlier. So some people you see, even when they're loading or right when they hit the bottom, they're already on that forefoot. And then you take care of the ankle mobility, you get them some range, and now they can keep the heels down for longer. So that's one example of, we don't need extreme ankle dorsiflexion range of motion. We just need enough. Mm. We need enough to get into the proper positions. And so like for an ankle mobility test, if you did like, a, if you brought out a measuring tape, you went half kneel position, uh, and then we drove the knee over the toe to try to touch that wall. A lot of athletes are touching from three inches. I want you to be able to touch from four or five, ideally probably five. Uh, so basically the, the, the distance between the wall and your big toe would be five inches, yeah. of course, while keeping that heel down on the ground. But now people go, yeah, well, what if I did six? What if I did seven? <laughs> now you're getting into a, a, an area where you're probably going to decrease your stability, you're increasing your mobility, and, and you're going to significantly hinder your performance. Yeah, and that's how you differentiate if you're that athlete that needs it or doesn't need it. If you you know you do that test and, and right away you hit five inches, you're like, okay, I'm good. I don't need to worry about any you know mobility in the ankle. And you do that test and you hit three inches. Okay, I need to address this. Exactly. So if, if you're listening, and you're like, well, how do I know? And, yeah. You know, Exactly. And so there's different limiters, like we would have to do a whole podcast on whether it's a soft tissue or, you know, there's a lot of different um, reasons for those tight ankles. So more mobility still might not be the answer, but generally we'll throw out that general statement. Mm -hmm. If you're touching from two, three inches, uh, we're probably going to have to work on some mobility. Um, now for our guys that touch from five inches, you won. Congratulations. Yeah. So now it's we're going to get our mobility through our full range of motion strength training, and we're going to get it through our dynamic warm up. But our static stretch is going to be very limited. Some of our guys, we don't even do a static stretch with. Uh, we just do more of a traditional cool down, um, some breathing to get you back into the parasympathetic nervous system. But we skip the static stretch. Uh, and then mobility days, we skip completely. Um, unless they have a different joint. Like some people, they're already. They're like hypermobile in the ankles, but they don't have enough in the hip. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you already have enough mobility overall, then we don't need to isolate any joint. Let's just do full range of motion strength training. Like you can do overhead deep squats and you can maintain the stability and the mobility throughout the whole body. And, and that's all you're ever going to need. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, can we get into the positions? Now, the positions that I'm looking for, uh, well, let me go back. If you were to do an active straight leg raise, you know, you keep one leg down on the ground, keep your knee down on the ground, and we raise that other leg, where are you getting? Because we want somewhere between 80 and 90 degrees. In the hamstring. Gauge. In the ham yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and it could be a different, it's anywhere in the post chain. So mm -hmm. that could be your glutes that limit it, calves, whatever. It's, it's normally hamstrings or the positioning of your pelvis can actually influence that. But, you know, can we get back in that 80 to 90 degree range? Because some people are getting 100, 120. You won. Like if anything, let's let's get you more tight because there is a correlation between uh, the the stiffness and the rate of force development. Because if I go to create tension, you know how fast can I create tension in the muscle? If I have a ton of slack, it's going to take longer for me to create tension in that muscle. And so, I need enough stiffness in the muscle and in the tendon to where when my brain sends that signal to contract, it can rapidly create tension and 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 exert that. Uh, that that energy through the tendon reach the bone and then we move mm -hmm. right but if we have too much slack um, then it's it's lag time so uh, you know a, a lot of people are, are beyond 90 degrees slow down let's do our dynamic warm-ups but let's not do any additional stretching yeah I think that's you know goes back to the self-awareness as a, as a coach trainer and an athlete yourself because because I think stretching is kind of one of those general things that's just like, oh, you're supposed to stretch prior, you're supposed to stretch after. Uh, but again, the attention to detail of what is your results for the training itself, you know, if you know, right. focus on that and then, you know, break it down into smaller, smaller fragments. Right. And so we could spend a, we could spend several hours talking about assessments, but you know, we'll talk about this more in the future, but, uh, Generally, you first step is you got to figure out where you are on that spectrum. Are you hypermobile? Are you overly stiff? Um, and then we want to be probably somewhere in the middle. We want to be able to hit all the essential positions. Now, I'm looking at different positions than most strength coaches are looking at. I don't just want general functional movement. There's certain things that I want to see. If you're a basketball player, 
I want to see certain things on the court. Like, uh, you know, I talk about the, um, I, I don't know how to explain, but like Kyrie Irving, you know, he goes one way, he's getting an inward shin angle. Mm -hmm. It looks like he's almost in such a big valgus collapse that he's going to like rip through his knee. It's not actually a valgus collapse. He's in a big hip internal rotation and then his ankle uh, can really turn out. A lot of people aren't able to turn that ankle out. So you're significantly limited because you don't have that that hip internal rotation and the ability to turn that foot out. So now your overall handles, your bag is significantly limited because you can never get to that position. And that's just as important for ball handling as any drill that you could ever do. And so guys like Kyrie Irving, guys like Kemba Walker, who really get great shin angles, and shin angles is everything for ball handling. If you can get those good shin angles, um, then you're going to be a really good mover, deceleration-wise and acceleration-wise. Um, and so I'm looking at, do you have enough hip internal rotation? Do we have the ability to turn the ankles out like that? Uh, because if we don't, you're going to be limited. And then if you try, we're going to get an injury. So like every time I post Kyrie doing that, everybody goes in the comments and is like, oh man, that's going to lead to an injury. Not for him because he has that range of motion. For you, if you try to do that at high speed without a ra that range of motion, that's a torn ACL. Yeah. So yes, for you, that's an injury. Uh, but these are all things where we could build that general capacity. We could build that general mobility uh, in the weight room and then gradually transition it uh, onto the court more and get it more into your game moves and eventually you could really take off as a ball handler without ever touching a basketball yeah and i think that's you know what i mean in, in terms of bringing value to, to a young player and and, and you know and, and again back as, as a fan when you're observing things you're like oh you know they're so blessed they're so you know what i mean they're, they're born with that they're born with that ability and and then when you go in and you dissect the movements on film and then go back into the weight room and be like okay how can we how can we get the body into these positions whether it's a mobility a flexibility standpoint or, or what are the limiting factors we can figure that out and, and expand your game expand your bag and, and right and get those things and that's actually an important topic though because sometimes people didn't build that through the weight room, mm -hmm. right? Kyrie Irving probably didn't stretch mm -hmm. his way there. Mm -hmm. Kyrie Irving has played so much basketball from such a young age, and he's always been working on his handles. He developed this ability. Now, how he got there may not be how you're going to get there because you maybe didn't get the same deliberate practice hours at a young age. And so we have to spend extra attention. And so that's why I'm always decoding the top performers, reverse engineer it, figure out what are the qualities that allowed them to do that. Because then when you get somebody who's 19 years old and you don't have these movements at all, well, you're not going to develop it naturally because you're 19 years old. You yeah. didn't have the same deliberate practice hours that Kyrie had. So now how can we accelerate that? Yeah. Uh, no, I think that was good. I think, uh, you know, if, if, if you're listening and, and, you know, there's things that maybe you want us to, to address deeper, um, you know, whether you're, you're a youth athlete or, uh, you know, a player trying to expand their game, trying to grow, or you're a coach or a trainer, um, you know, whatever it is, you know, uh, reach out to the, the, the multiple media pa pa platforms that, uh, that PGF Performance has. Um, and just know that, you know, this content is, is for the, the user um, across all, all forms. And, and I think that's part of what's motivated you to, to take this route with the podcast is just for sure for sure 100 percent. like we're not doing this just to listen to ourselves talk yeah. <laughs> like uh, that we're doing this so that you guys can really benefit uh from this content so uh, be sure to ask your questions and a really good place to ask the questions is just our instagram comments i read every comment that's ever been posted on my page uh you know i wish i had the time to personally respond to everyone i get back to as many as i can i'm not gonna be able to get back to all comments but just know that we read your comments, we appreciate it, uh, and we take it into account. So Skylar's going to be able to go in and, and really look at everything. I'm going to look at everything and figure out, okay, what are the common trends as far as what our users want to listen to? And that's going to guide where we go uh, with this podcast. So be sure to reach out and be sure to ask your questions. Yeah, and, and, and with questions as well as, uh, you know, guest recommendations, you know, guests that you'd like to see us, uh, you know, have on the show and, and, and communicate with and kind of dive deeper into what they do and, you know, whatever avenue they're in that, that connects to, to basketball, to training, to sports, athleticism, the whole nine. So let yes, us know. Yes, sir. All right. See you guys next time.